leave, come back again Locking through the key out I can swallow You're my prison, I call you my friend Hello and uh, welcome to this week's episode of The Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Okay, um, this afternoon, this is the last episode, uh, well, for a while anyway, that uh, I'll be using samples that were entered into the 2015 World Whiskey Awards and um, well in actual fact I've only got two. Uh, I had intended to use a, a couple of uh, other bottlings um, but I sort of checked the notes and uh, had a, a sort of like um, a quick sniff of them and thought no I'm not going to use those. Um, frankly they were bloody awful um, and well I, I could have used them I mean you know they would have been sort of a good tool should we say to to show some of the uh, things that uh, can happen to whiskies that may or may not make them particularly uh, appetizing to me anyway um, and you know I, I do tend to occasionally criticize whiskies you know constructively I like to think and um, uh, so I wouldn't think there was anything wrong in that but uh, at the end of the day I think I'd, I'd much rather prefer to um, share good whiskies with you you know this is the whole reason for the program you know um, so that's why I decided to leave the match I had to um, shoehorn in a couple of replacements which uh, I think are pretty damn good so uh, it's not like it's a, a big issue shall we say um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the the, the reasoning behind t today's episode. We've got a, a combination of uh, vatted malt whiskies and actual proper blends. Um, I think uh, three and three. I think in actual fact. Um, so I think this should be quite an interesting episode of the show. And I'm fo funnily enough, I have a compass box, uh, as you could tell from the. Um, uh, the starting, uh, the, the, the entry picture. Um, no apologies for using a compass box bottling. Uh, I think um, I've done the Great King Street uh, before and uh, it's pretty bloody good. And it neatly ties in with a comment that um, I forget the, uh, the, the chap's name um, left on the last week's uh, episode of the show about compass box fueling um, the the prices of, of older uh, blended and vatted malts and I, I, I can't totally agree with that I mean I think what Compass Box have certainly done uh, through the, you know their skillful use of, uh, of, of malt and grain whiskies and, and producing some absolutely sensational whiskies is, is bring uh, public perception to the, the whole blended sector um, I mean I know that sounds probably a bit of a stupid thing to say considering that the blended whiskey sector is the largest proportion of the whiskey section uh, sector rather um, but uh, so much focus is on single malts these days uh, to almost the exclusion of blends and there are a lot of people that poo poo blends that sort of think they are you know not as good as a single malt which of course is, is absolutely uh, absolutely rubbish there's some absolutely brilliant blends you know, as I've hopefully demonstrated uh, over the course of time. And um, I think sort of certainly, you know, bottling companies like Compass Box have brought that to the attention of the general public. And at the end of the day, I don't think they've kind of fueled the, uh, the, the price increases to a certain extent of, of mature whiskies because mature whiskies, it's law of economics uh, at the end of the day. <laughs> a cask of 20-odd-year-old, um, malt whiskey from a, a relatively well-known distillery is easily and I know going to set you back about five figures there is no, whereas a, a cask of whiskey from say a lesser well-known distillery you know sub 10 years old is going to cost you a fraction of that you know probably a tenth I would have uh, imagined so um, it's the law of supply and demand you know old whiskey is going to cost a lot more money therefore the retail cost is going to be higher it's as simple as that at the end of the day and um, so like I said I've got no no problem with including a, a compass box in today's range and um, well I don't think there's really a great deal left to say apart from um, let's have a look at today's range close our feelings convince me to believe in you right okay so today we're going to kick off with the scallywag now this was I believe introduced in 
2013. This particular sample is a little bit of an old one. It comes from 2014. It is it's a sherry monster. In actual fact, <laughs> I seem to have quite a few sherry uh, uh, whiskies here today. Um, and it is you know a, a, basically a vatting of uh, Speyside malt, principally from Mortlack, Macallan, and uh, Glenrothes. And um, the initial bottling that I tasted back in 2013, I think, just had a little bit too more too much of the uh, of the Glenrothin and. Uh, um, correct uh, pronunciation there I hasten to add um, and uh, it was a little bit on the hard side and I must admit I was not a huge fan of it um, so it'll be interesting to see what this batch tastes like and of course this is always the thing with with uh, small batch bottlings there's always going to be batch variation talking about small batch bottlings uh, talking about very very small batch bottlings the next bottling we'll be looking at is a single cask uh, so this is um, the Morrison and Mackay uh, Old Perth Limited Edition. Now, I, I think I've used the, old, the standard Old Perth, which I think is you know, a pleasant vatted malt uh, in a previous episode of the show. But uh, recently, um, probably about two months ago now, um, they released two limited edition variants in that particular range. And this is the first one we're looking at. It is... Um, uh, a single cast, like I said, it was uh, filled with both Macallan and Highland Park. Quite interesting. Uh, it was distilled in 2014, bottled uh, at some stage uh, this year, uh, making it 12 years old. Bottled at 43.9%. So, uh, unfortunately, I only got a handful of these bottles and they've all since sold out. But I have some of these ones left, which is the other Morrison Mackay Old Perth limited edition this is the 21 year old now i don't know what has gone into this uh and i don't know if it's a single cask or not i have a feeling it possibly is or was should we say um again it could have been pre-blended um uh, that again is not information that uh, was made available to me but it is like i said it's 21 years old it was distilled in 1996 bottled in uh, earlier this year and it was bottled at 55.4 uh, percent okay then we're going to move on to the first of the three uh, proper blended whiskies the first one we'll be looking at is uh, uh, the boutique whiskey company's uh, blended malt uh, num batch number one in actual fact um, I think this was released around about late 2014 it was bottled at 50.3 percent and that's about as much as i know about it because it's one of maverick drinks's uh, uh, portfolio and um well they weren't exactly particularly forthcoming with effusive praise should we say about last week's episode of the show in actual fact met with complete and utter stony silence i mean i know some uh, and I tweeted it to, to both them and to Master of Malt and uh, I know Master of Malt are a little bit more proactive, should we say, on social media and what happened? Completely and utterly bloody ignored. Well, what a surprise. Um, anyway, I'm going to include that and I probably could say it's an absolute pile of crap but, you know, um, I'm not vindictive. <laughs> then we're going to move on to the Great King Street. This is the Glasgow blend, uh, which uh, is a blend <laughs> uh, of malt and grain. It's 67% uh, Highland malt. Now, I did ask uh, Compass Box uh, what was in this, because you can email them and ask for the, the recipe, but they never got back to me in time. Um, so I'm going to have to have a, a bit of a guess, uh, knowing what um, Compass Box tend to use and uh, um, what they have a, a bit of a fetish for. So 67% Highland Malt, I'm guessing possibly uh, Tianinish um, and or Kleinelish. They tend to be two malts that tend to crop up quite regularly in their bottlings, uh, with um, a, uh, some Isla. Uh, which I'm you can pretty much be assured is going to be Colila. It's the you know, the one that sloshes about on the independent market quite readily, um, and uh, it's uh, thirty three percent lowland grain whiskey. Which again, I would have a guess at Cameron Bridge because that tends to be the grain whiskey that uh, um, John tends to use more often than not. 
It's been aged in a combination of American oak, uh, French oak, which I'm guessing is probably the uh, custom casks that uh, they make, and some sherry as well. So uh, um, a little bit of peat. Could be, could be nice. Well, I know it's nice. I mean, I've reviewed it before, you know. Um, and finally, we're going to end on uh, a re really quite interesting bottling. Uh, and uh, I like the whole concept of this uh, particular company. This is uh, the Lost Distilleries Blend. This is batch number five, uh, and it was bottled at 50.4%. And obviously, as the title suggests, uh, it is. Um, uh, a blended malt made up from distilleries that no longer exist and how the hell they managed to get their hands on uh, some of this stuff I have absolutely no idea but it is comprised of malt whiskey from Capadonic um, which I've tasted some good ones and some pretty ropey ones it has to be said Rosebank which is a, one of my favourite uh, distilleries I'm you know absolutely stunning Imperial again you know Good, good quality malt from uh, that particular distillery. Mostoi, um, which I should have done my homework on, but I have a funny feeling that Mostoi was a distillery that was inside one of the grain distilleries uh, off the top of my head, I think. Uh, very rarely come across it. I think I've only ever tasted it on a couple of occasions. Uh, I think Duncan Taylor bottling, I think. And I, I remember it being a quite heavy, oily uh, kind of malt. Uh, apparently there's some Brora in there, which you all well know is the uh, uh, the, the old Klein Ellish distillery, and some Port Ellen. Hmm. Teaspoonful, one would imagine. And the grain comes from Port Thunder. So we're looking at uh, some obvious age. I mean, a lot of these distilleries closed way back in the... Uh, um, in the mid 80s so uh, it's going to be at least well yeah, you're looking at a blend that's going to be well in excess of 20 odd years old so uh, could be interesting so that's today's uh, lineup I um, think we better kick off with a bit of scallywag I think but you won't stop. Now I give right okay so it's a bit of scallywag uh, this is part of the um, the regional malt range that uh, that, that uh, they produce uh, including uh, Big Pete, um, Douglas Hang, I should say, uh, Big Pete, uh, Rock Oyster, um, and there's a Lowland one, which is named the Epicurean. Um, and there's this one, this is Scallywag, so uh, let's see what uh, one those gives us. Obvious uh, sherry character, um, no doubt about that. It's got a. Uh, feels to me, a t you know, there's a little bit of first fill Oloroso with that sort of herbalness, but there's some sweet um, refill um, sherry notes also it's a lot rounder, a lot s softer and sweeter than the uh, the first time that I came across it like I said there's a you can you can smell the Glenroth slightly in the background uh, with that almost that sort of slightly hard kind of character but it's predominantly you know the Mortlac uh, Macallan axis and um, there's a, a little bit of Almost gristiness, uh, a little bit of um, malt and um, cereal. Perfectly pleasant, it has to be said. Um, I must admit, it's not sort of, I mean, as you know, I keep saying it, not the world's biggest uh, sherry fan, and unless it's got some serious age attached to it. And this is moderate, uh, moderately aged, I would have said. There's certainly a, a, a pleasant... Um, feel of different age spirits uh, happening in here so let's see what the palette's like a lot more first fill on on the palette richer denser treacly um, just coffee burnt wood it's kind of classic Mort Lackey, Macallan, first fill, Oloroso, um, clean and no blemishes whatsoever. Um, thankfully, I'm not tasting very much of the Glenroth uh, coming through. There's a little bit of edginess right on the finish, which kind of, I'd imagine, is what's happening coming from that. Uh, there's a touch of spice, uh, medium length. Um, yeah. Perfectly serviceable um, sherry matured whiskey. If that's your kind of cup of tea, then well, you know, 
it's 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 pretty pleasant. I hold my breath because I don't need it when I with you. Right, okay, so let's move on to the first of the two old Perth bottlings. This is the 12 year old, this is the uh, the cask that was filled with uh, Macallan and Highland Park. So let's see what uh, what this gives us. Smells older than 12 years old, it has to be said. It's got that big, dense, rich, pruney, dark dried fruits, raisins, um, dark honey, licorice, treacle, touch of smoke, which I'm guessing is probably coming from the Highland Park. It's got a nice sort of uh, aromatic character, it's got a bit of sweetness. Again, if I didn't know, I think I would be hard pushed to sort of, you know, figure out um, where this came from. As there's absolutely, as you would expect, pretty much zero um, distillery character. Um, but it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's, you know, from a sherry point of view, um, it's got plenty of complexity. Um, like I say, it's got that little bit of Highland Parky smoke. It's a not much in the way of brine, so I'm guessing this has spent pretty much most of its life on, on the mainland. It's, you know, it's, it's a big and chewy whiskey, which is what I'm expecting on the palate, so let's see if that's uh, the case then, shall we? Very soft succulent juicy classic Macallan really there's no rough edges it's all very soft generous prunes walnut a little bit of almond possibly as well on the finish touch of smoke um, some spice yeah it's it's not bad it's pleasant like I said you're not going to expect any distillery character whatsoever but I think for a, a sherry 12 year old um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty enjoyable, and um, I guess you can argue that the selling point is possibly more on the combination of the the, the, the spirits, uh, you know, the, the, the uniqueness, I guess, of this particular cask. So, uh, but yeah, you, know, you can't argue with the quality. It's it's pretty good. I give myself to you. Right. Okay. So let's move on to the twenty-one-year-old. This is. Uh, Bottle at a slightly higher ABV, which is actually quite surprising, really, when you think uh, um, this is, you know, considerably older than the 12 year old, but that's the wonderful thing with casks, isn't it? Um, and it all comes down to where they're stored. But anyway, um, let's see what the 21 gives us, shall we? It's got some lovely maturity. It's just starting to develop that slightly Armagnac y kind of rancio, the sort of darker dried fruits. Again, it feels first fill Oloroso. It's rich, it's chunky. There's a touch of wood smoke. Um, mm, now that is a lovely whiskey. Excuse me. <laughs> the Highland Park coming back at me. Um, the um, yeah, I mean th this now. I, this is where I like sherry whiskies. I like sherry whiskies with some age. Yeah, again, no distillery character. I mean, I couldn't tell you where this came from. I mean, I'm guessing there's possibly some space. It's a space side of some form or description. It, um, like I said, I mean, I, 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 I possibly Macallan. Um, it, but I think if this was a wholly Macallan, 21 year old, even privately bottled, it wouldn't be 70 quid a bottle, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, there's some dried citrus fruit, some dried orange, a little bit of wood spice. Beautiful malt, beautiful. It has to be said. Um, and uh, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, like I said, I mean, it's, I keep saying it's not the style that I'm, you know, most uh, most into, shall we say? But one can appreciate good whiskey. Uh, that's all I can say. So let's see what the palate's like. It's long, luscious, soft, juicy, um, Christmas cakey. Uh, like I said, the nose kind of indicates 
batch of developing um, dried fruit rancio, the, the oxidation is starting to have an effect. Um, quite a lot of peat in actual fact on the, on the finish now. Um, getting sort of that coal dusty kind of peat. Um, hmm, interesting. Um, yeah, re pretty complex, got some lovely maturity, good length, you know, 70 quid a bottle, well, yeah, why not? I mean, I think that's that's an amazingly good value for money at the end of the day. Um, mm, yeah, that's good, that's good whiskey. Okay, so let's move on to the Boutique uh, Whiskey Company blend. This was batch number one, which is probably all sold out now, I would imagine, as this was bottled um, you know, about three years ago. So 50.3%, let's see what the nose gives. That is a lovely nose. Um, American oak, obviously. Uh, it's got some. It's got a bit of age. Um, there's a little bit of oxidation character coming through. Some dried apricot, white licorice, um, touch of honey. Again, kind of feels middle aged, possibly. Um, just started to develop that kind of aged oxidized rancio so I'm guessing somewhere in the sort of late teens possibly early 20s doesn't quite have the sort of dusty American oak kind of character but it's got some some lovely vanilla um, and it's just wonderfully aromatic this is just a lovely blend I'm not getting a huge amount of the grain there's a, there's a little nip um, just beneath the surface that sort of hints at the at the sort of freshening grain kind of note and that's that's one of the things I love about blended whiskies um, is that you know the, the, the grain component does its job you know it can often add a sort of a freshening element a crispness a freshness um, to uh, to you know some old malt and that's not to say that that's a it's just what it is it does what it's supposed to do shall we say um, yeah, this is this is a lovely whiskey. It has to be said. So um, yeah, hats off. Talking about the Boutique Whiskey Company, their labels. Now I know there's some of you that absolutely love their labels. They love that funky kind of artwork and all that kind of stuff. And I'm afraid I'm not one of them. I've never signed up to this whole Richard Branson funky kind of guys. Yeah, we're down with the kids kind of stuff. Um, no, not my cup kind of cup of tea. Uh, at all, um, give me a sort of a more traditional style label, and I'm happier with that. Um, but at the end of the day, thankfully, you know, I'm evaluating it on the liquid, on not on the actual labelling. But um, like I said, there's a lot of you that actually do like their labels. But anyway, let's see what the palace like. Mm. Juicy, no, no, fleshy more than juicy, rich, full apricot, touch of uh, oxidised fruit kind of coming through, a um, little bit of citrus, uh, grain kind of comes through on the finish, and again, it's giving that a real tingling, I mean obviously that's being emphasised by um, the alcohol, um, it does make it feel a little bit drying on the finish, but it's certainly got the weight there um, and the richness of fruit to sort of like, you know, offset that and carry it along. I mean, that is a stunningly good blend. I, you know, I have to say, I mean, as much as I dislike the uh, uh, the marketing and the sort of like we're all kind of hip, maybe it's because I just don't have a beard. That's what it is. That's why I'm not getting it. I don't wear a check shirt and have a beard. Um, all right, I'm probably you know <laughs> going for a little bit too much, but you know what I mean. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the liquid that's in that glass or in the bottle is exceptionally good. Now, um, whether that goes for the rest of the, their their range or not, of course they they're going to be like every other independent bottler. They're going to they're going to bottle some really good stuff. They're going to bottle some rubbish. You know, it just goes without reason, which is why at the end of the day, yeah. I have to taste it before it goes on the shelf. Otherwise, you know, 
I could be selling complete rubbish, uh, and I don't want to do that. But anyway, um, coming back to this particular bottling, um, yeah, that's that's pretty damn good. You won't stop. I throw my hands. Okay, so let's move on to the compass box. This is the Great King Street Glasgow blend. Um, let's see what the nose gives us. Fresh, uh, very Highland, very crisp, very granity. Um, classically Highland in actual fact, but there's softness underneath it. There's a touch of vanilla. There's some lovely American oak. Some creaminess. Um, there's a little bit of the grain just kind of like, again, kind of mingling in with that kind of um, granity note. The, the peat is very subtle. It's very it's almost like a cloud of, of peat dust. Um, it's slightly medicinal, um, but it's it's beautifully balanced, sublimely balanced in actual fact. And this is the the key with blended whiskies. It's all about the balance. Well, it's about balance with every whiskey, but probably more so with blended whiskey. And when you start using uh, peat. You, know, you have to be careful with it, you know, one slip and suddenly your your, your blend is just OTT on the peak front and um, you kind of then lose the, the nuances, but, you know, John has just got this just absolute spot on. No surprise there really is there at the end of the day. Um, I mean, Mr. Glazer is, um, shall we say, rather good at this. Um, God. They're just a gorgeous nose, and and this is so underlooked, and they are not expensive. I mean, you know, sub thirty quid for the fifty cl bottlings, thirty five ish for the seventy cl. Yeah, you are getting a lot of whiskey for um for your money. It has to be said, and um, I like that. That's really good. Let's see what the power's like. Wow, 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 that goes on and on and on. Light, delicate, crisp, but underneath there's a fullness, a richness, which is why kind of, I think there's certainly some, some Klein Elish at work here, because Klein Elish has actually got, got quite a nice, rich character. Um, and certainly the crispness, which again, would lead me down the tea in each kind of range, or um, kind of, Bal Blair, maybe Agnock, but I know it's not going to, that those two distilleries don't sell um, their casks, so I'm pretty certain it's not going to be that. Um, yeah, lovely, absolutely gorgeous. Just a, a fleck of peat right on the finish, a little bit of dustiness, um, some vanilla, a little bit of graininess from the French oak as well. It's just harmonious it's just so balanced you, you can pick out the individual notes but really it just kind of like has this wholeness to it this this oneness and uh, um that that is what a good blend is 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 all about in my opinion and um you know for those of you that think that blends are lesser than single malt buy that buy that or buy the the, the non-peated um King Street blend because that's going to change your mind. I can tell you that for nothing. I give myself to you. Right, okay, finally we are on to the Lost Distilleries blend. So let's um let's see what the nose gives us then, shall we? Oh yes, that's got some age to it. Um elegant, delicate. It's got some crisp, fresh notes, um, some citrus, some white fruit. There's a little bit of oily barley. Oh, 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 that is absolutely sublime. Touch of smoke, a little bit of medicinal note, a little bit of licorice, honey. I just keep, you know, I just keep going on, you know. You you stick your nose in, and you can find find practically whatever you like. Um, that is just a damn good blend. Um, yeah, the, the kind of emphasis is more on the sort of um, Rosebank Imperial uh, kind of axis with that sort of 
fresh aromatic, well, say fresh for a 20 odd plus year old whiskey. I mean, it does have a real fresh note to it and um, touch of salt as well, which is surprising. A um, little bit of, little bit of peat. But again, sort of, you know, Brewer, um, not a huge amount of Port Ellen, I would imagine, in this. So, um, although in saying that, I've tasted some fairly heftily peated Brewers in, uh, over the years. Um, again, this is just so, so well balanced. You know, you've got just everything in its, its right kind of um, um, amount. You know, not too much oak, not too much peat. Oh, it has got some age. That's stunning, absolutely stunning. Let's see what the pulse like. Mm, getting that lovely peat through on the finish now. Um, touch fuller on the palate, uh, a little bit richer, denser, touch more oak. Um, lovely maturity but again that's got that lovely freshness to it that minerally kind of salty minerally sort of citric kind of axis is just mm, mouth watering I mean again you know it, it feels like there's some some quite young malt at work in there but of course you know knowing these distilleries there, there can't be um, so it's just amazing and I mean Part of that's probably down to the rose bank. I've tasted some old rose bank that still retained that kind of fresh character. Um, but oh wow, that is incredible! It just lingers. I mean, that is just amazingly good. And well, you know, when, uh, maybe with the exception of the Capadonic, which can be a bit hit and miss, uh, certainly all the uh, other whiskies from the, those distilleries are, are class. It has to be said. And. Um, mm, Gently peated, like I said, on the finish. Uh, oh, damn, that's a bloody good whiskey to finish with. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. Well, I've, I hope you've enjoyed this kind of couple of looks at, uh, at blended stroke vatted malt whiskies because, like I said, I think it's a... Uh, um, a style of whiskey that is is kind of overlooked by a lot of people you know i mean we i get it all the time in the shop people come in and i want a single malt single malt single malt single malt and that is because the marketing bods at uh, various distilleries are kind of like you know ramming it down your throat that single malts are the greatest thing since sliced bread and well some of them are uh, you know some of them are incredible you know but the whole point of a blended or a vatted whiskey is that it's supposed to be greater than the sum of its parts and you know what I think all of these have displayed that I think the scallywag I think is not particularly expensive it's not particularly old it's well made it's it's kind of you know if you like Macallan you like Mortlach you like the, the that big sherry kind of character then well you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with that the um uh, old Perth 12 year old again ticks all the boxes for those kind of people that like that kind of whiskey maybe a little bit more complexity it has to be said um unfortunately completely sold out now so if you like the sound of that well i'm sorry it's all kind of gone i do like i said i do have some of the 21 year old left and again you know that is the, the type of uh, shared whiskey that i really like give it some age um and you start to get those uh you know secondary characters uh, ristics from the, uh, the the aging and you know it's kind of like what you lose in one from from one part you gain from another and yeah that's that's the way these things are um the boutique whiskey company blend yeah very very good got no issue with that at all might have an issue with um, maverick drinks but certainly no issue with the liquid in the bottle um meow um <laughs> uh, the compass box the great king street yeah stunning fabulous whiskey inexpensive um a, a must buy in my in my personal opinion you know and you know i do my best when it comes to try selling these things and you know there are customers that come into the shop that you know are a little bit more open-minded that don't necessarily have the sort of 
I want a single malt kind of mentality, which is really nice. And um, finally, the, the Lost Distilleries um, blend. Well, yeah, whiskey of the day, it has to be said. Absolutely stunning, and you would bloody well hope so, uh, given what goes into it. Uh, I must admit, I didn't look up how much that was retailing for, but yeah, that ain't going to be cheap, is it? I mean, come on, you know. Um, but bloody good, nevertheless. So there you go. That's this week's episode of the show. I really do hope. I, don't, I know that a lot of you that watch the show are probably more open-minded than than your average kind of punter, should we say, um, and are prepared to give things a go and all that kind of stuff. And so, to a certain extent, I'm probably preaching to the converted at the end of the day. But for those of you that still haven't. Uh, encountered the joys of good quality vatted and blended whiskey. I mean, there are a, there's a lot of cheap and nasty stuff out there, as we well know. Um, then I think, um, yeah, you you got to go for it. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the show. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next week. I've kind of got to the end of the planned episodes and I want to do another gin episode but I know nobody bloody watches them you know which is a real shame I mean I know gin has kind of like run its course to a certain extent and we're now plateauing out shall we say but you know I've, I've got a load of gin samples what the hell am I supposed to do with them well I suppose I could drink them couldn't I anyway good afternoon and good ramming